Now, radicalization used to be like a super cool term, you know, meant like you used to wear your hat backwards and do some kick flips and ollies and gave no shits about parking lots or their guards. Now it's just a term to boil the religion of Islam down to jihad and terror and spread a new fun kind of patriotic racism and xenophobia like a verbal black plague. I mean, the way that it's sold to most of us is that these American citizens that have been radicalized just hate America and its fountains and fountains of freedom. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Before we dive into this week's episode, I just want to remind everybody that if you would like to support this show financially, you can do so by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Everything starts at only $2 a month. For only $2 a month, you get exclusive unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling sets that are only available to the patrons, uh, and you get early access to multi-part forkful of noodles when they come out. On top of that, you also get free tickets to shows, uh, uh, exclusive drawings from me as well, a bunch of other cool rewards. So go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha and check out the rewards, check out the tiers, check out the goals that you'll be supporting. Uh, I don't have any corporate or small business sponsors for this show. So by becoming a patron, I am sponsored by you, the people. I am a people-sponsored show. So once again, that's patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Now, on to this week's show. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo America's deadliest human care bear, went on Fox News to say that the recent assassination of one of Iran's top officials, General Qassem Soleimani, was totally justified because there was an imminent attack planned on the American people. He followed that up with, we're not sure when or where, but this was real. There is no doubt that there were a series of imminent attacks that were being plotted by Qasem Soleimani. We don't know precisely when, and we don't know precisely where, but it was real. Okay, since the definition of imminent is knowing the when, I am really concerned that Pompeo's sense of time and reality are crumbling. We should probably check if Mike Pompeo is schizophrenic. C can we pull up some interviews from, from the past? Has... Has Mike Pompeo ever mentioned the shadow people? Has he confused the Iranian citizens with shadow people? Because of this very blatant act of war and a very illegal assassination of a foreign leader, America is on the doorstep of another war. And by the way, this is like really illegal, not faux illegal, like smoking pot or jaywalking. Okay, this is what we should be putting people in prison for, not smoking a plant or, in the case of Julian Assange, being a fucking journalist. I feel like war crime should be on the top of the list of things we should put people in prison for forever. You know, that and taking up two parking spots in a grocery store. You people are monsters. To recap the situation in Iran, back in 2017, Trump backed out of the Iran nuclear deal, leaving Europe to deal with them. In 2019, Iran was blamed for attacking a Japanese oil tanker, which all felt like a false flag operation, you know, very similar to Vietnam and the Gulf of Tonkin. Then, just a few weeks ago, Iran's top military and political figure, General Qassem Soleimani, was assassinated in a civilian airport in Baghdad after he was on a peace mission in Iraq. Not only that, but there was also an assassination of attempt on a bunch of other top officials of Iran in Yemen. The Washington Post reports that on the same day that the U.S. killed Qassem Soleimani, and Abu Mahdi al-Muhandas in Baghdad, 
The U.S. also tried to murder a senior Iranian military official in Yemen. That mission failed. And this failed assassination raises more doubt that the U.S. was trying to prevent an imminent attack as it claimed. Instead, it appears the U.S. was carrying out an assassination campaign against top Iranian military leaders and their allies. Soleimani was talking to the Prime Minister of Iraq to figure out how to broker more peaceful resolutions between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The Iraqi Prime Minister, Adil Abdul Mahdi, has said that Soleimani came to Baghdad not to plot an attack, but to in fact carry out a diplomatic mission aimed at reducing tensions with Saudi Arabia. Wait, was this the imminent threat? Peace in the Middle East? I mean, yeah, sure, having two Middle Eastern superpowers not under the thumb of American imperialism would be a very big threat to people that are trying to profit off the war in that region. I mean, to America, peace is the biggest threat, considering America has been at war 228 out of the 244 years that they've been a country. I mean, that's how we've made our living as a nation. You know, we should really stop putting in God we trust on our currency and replace it with punching peace in the dick since 1776. And instead of a photo of the presidents, we should just have a picture of a, a, an eagle sucker punching a dove in the nads. The narrative we're being sold is that this assassination just took out one of the biggest bad guys in the Middle East. And the reinforcement of this false narrative comes from this so-called imminent attack and the threat that they pose to America. So the real question is, how true is that? Since 9-11, has America been under attack and threatened? Since 9-11, the primary threat to American freedoms has been reported to be jihadist terror attacks. Now, over the last few decades, these reports have shown that these jihadis are actually American citizens or legal residents of the United States of America that have converted to an extreme version of Islam. The term radicalization was born into the American vernacular as the Amer uh, a part of American counterintelligence efforts. Let's do that one again, too. Since 9-11, the primary threat to American freedoms have been jihadist terror attacks. Now, over the last few decades, there have been a bunch of reports that have shown that these jihadists are American citizens or legal residents of the United States of America that have converted to an extreme version of Islam. And the term radicalization was born into the American vernacular as part of a counterintelligence narrative. Now, radicalization used to be like a super cool term, you know, meant like you used to wear your hat backwards and do some kick flips and ollies and gave no shits about parking lots or their guards. Now it's just a term to boil the religion of Islam down to jihad and terror and spread a new fun kind of patriotic racism and xenophobia like a verbal black plague. I mean, the way that it's sold to most of us is that these American citizens that have been radicalized just hate America and its fountains and fountains of freedom. You know, all the fun freedoms that we have, like being censored for calling out war crimes and corporate charlatans and making sure that their feet are held to the fire for fucking over the middle class. You know, the, the, the freedom that we have to be in debt for wanting our health to be good and, and just wanting an education, right? You know, the freedom that you get to be harassed and attacked by the police for having just a little extra melanin in your skin. Oh, and let's not forget the freedom for, to get smeared for standing up for the working class. Oh, bo oh man, there, there's just so many freedoms, I don't even know what to do with myself. As Peter Bergen of New America points out, these easy explanation that jihadist terrorists in the United States are mad or bad proved simply wrong. Around 1 in 10 had mental health problems below the I in incidence in the general population nor were they typically career criminals. 12% had served time in prison compared to about 11% of the American male population. 
Perpetrators are generally motivated by a mix of factors, including militant Islamic ideology, dislike of American foreign policy in the Muslim world, a need to attach themselves to an ideology or organization that gave them a sense of purpose and a cognitive opening to militant Islam that often precipitated by personal disappointment like a death of a parent. For many, joining a jihadist group or carrying out an attack allowed them to become heroes in their own story. Finding purpose after a traumatic event like the death of a parent is what gave us Batman, you know? And, and he wound up building like a, like a space cult of other lonely, super-powered people that said they could save everyone. The Justice League. Had Bruce Wayne not become Batman and founded the Justice League, he might have joined an extremist group and done some really drastic things. But this is what these extremist groups or, or a cult sells you. Purpose and protagonism. When you're disillusioned or betrayed or in a bad place, it's easy to be seduced or influenced by these ideas. According to New America, 84 Americans have been radicalized by the terror group ISIS in Syria, a terror group that was birthed out of American interventionism. 23 of these converted Americans made it over to Syria to fight for them, and only 9 are at large. According to those numbers, it doesn't really seem like the cult is selling the Kool-Aid very well. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Snyder Cut of the Justice League still has more league members at large. And it's not for lack of trying, right? According to these counterintelligence narratives, social media is often used to radicalize citizens, especially the lonely and the angry. Now, this doesn't mean that social media is all bad, right? It, it just means that it's a tool that has unfortunately been used for bad things, like spreading radicalized messages and the censorship on behalf of the elites. Just because someone is using a hammer to hit somebody else in the head doesn't mean that the hammer's true purpose of putting things together should be ignored. Let's not be as extreme as the viewpoints that we're trying to fight here. And it's not just the jihadists that use social media. Far right-wing groups that preach extreme ideologies like white supremacy, nationalism, and hatred also use social media to radicalize the lonely and angry. Every time a mass shooting happens in America, there, there, there's a, a manifesto that's written online, just paragraphs upon paragraphs, you know, the one where you have to click read more, and then it takes you to like a whole new page, like that's, that's, on, that's on a lot of their social media platforms, and some of them use Twitter, and, that, and that's impressive that you got a whole manifesto in like 200 characters, that's, that's very impressive. And then you wonder, like, why didn't, why didn't anybody see this coming? Oh, could it be? Could it be that the social media algorithms are like a helicopter parent preventing anybody and trying to protect the world by making sure that nobody ever sees anything bad on their platforms ever? Or are we as a society too numb to this shit at this point? Based on how these narratives are spun... Anyone that's critical of America's imperialistic occupation of the Middle East and rich people's war for resources are just seen as just as dangerous as these extreme terror groups were told to fear. And nothing is more dangerous and extreme as simplified black or white thinking. And can we really expect anything more from a group of people that calls themselves counterintelligence as in counter to intelligence. I mean, the smart thing to do here when it comes to assessing and understanding the notions behind terror and extreme ideologies is to uh, take a look at the nuanced reasons and understanding of the various factors involved. But, but instead, because we're counter to intelligence, we just simplify them down to good or bad. And both Republicans and Democrats are radicalized when it comes to war. For these attacks on Iran, Trump is being praised and continues to be called presidential for his actions. 
And when, when Obama was president, the Democrats didn't say anything about his acts of war and increased drone warfare. People thought that Obama was somehow going to be the anti-war candidate. In fact, he had campaigned and said he was going to bring troops from Iraq to Afghanistan, That's what he called the good war. Um, and some of the big anti-war sort of uh, elements in society, um, uh, they, they, they kind of, I, I think they, they basically packed it up. Right. Uh, and so... And in, they supported his actions in Libya and Syria specifically. It was almost impossible to organize the kind of liberal progressive wing of the anti-war movement around those conflicts because they fell for these narratives that, you know, these are such evil bad guys and evil dictators that the U.S. has a responsibility to protect civilians abroad. Right. So so you saw a different elaboration of sort of the military doctrine or strategy um, from, from the Obama administration. It was a lot more sophisticated than you would say the crass um, hegemonic kind of rhetoric with us or against us history. yeah exactly so it was more sophisticated and that had an impact on the anti-war movement it also um you know i'd say that the the media played a very big role in, the, in both syria and libya they had a very unified message and the media itself i think functions in terms of enforcing discipline even among um, um the political elites they just justified his actions uh, under this black or white thinking. And any critiques of his hawkish policies were basically seen as traitorous and treasonous uh, uh, against the, their liberal savior. I mean, anti-war progressives were given a with us or against us ultimatum. Have... Ultimatums ever worked? I mean, every time someone throws an ultimatum at a loved one, no one chooses the person giving the ultimatum. You know, when I was nine, uh, my sister and I were given an ultimatum between our dad and the TV. Since then, every Father's Day, we watch all the 90s sitcoms about all the wacky dads because television was never mean to us or told us we were nothing without it. I, I think we made the right decision there. You know, anti-war activists chose to stand with the people who didn't ask for warfare. And besides, terror caused by jihadists is on par with terror caused by the radicalized right wing. Since 9-11, there have been 107 cases of radicalized jihadist terror and 109 cases of radicalized right-wing terror. I mean, if there is one thing white supremacy is better than converted brown radicals, it's terrorism. I mean, you guys did it. You guys really nailed it. You guys fucking took the cake on being better terrorists. Bravo. Bravo, white America. Bravo. So this brings us back to the original question we asked. Does Iran fit the narratives of imminent terror that Mike Pompeo and the Trump administration want us to believe? Well, considering that the biggest boogeyman in the Middle East right now is ISIS, and General Soleimani defeated ISIS in Syria and Iraq, I'd say no. In fact, the Syrian people are thankful for him and the Quds Force, you know, the Iranian Special Forces Group. Soleimani also defeated American troops in the Middle East with his Quds Force when America was backing Saddam Hussein. But America is a sore loser, so they went ahead and assassinated the general. And not only is this an act of war, but it's also an act of terror. Lest we forget that this did happen in a civilian airport in Iraq during a peace mission where he was flying as a diplomat. Also, this is a geopolitical temper tantrum. Okay, let's not forget, America is 240 years, and in terms of a country, that's not that old, right? America is basically a teenager, and, and we're, like, really confused about what to do with just our random boners. You know, like, right now, we, we're, we, we're thinking that our boners are very much associated to warfare. Like, we can't get fully erect unless we know that we're using the American middle class as cannon fodder for rich people's wars to take resources that technically don't belong to us because we're trying to manifest destiny the entire world. Like, that's why we think we're getting our boners. But it's, it's all just hormones. You know, you don't really figure out what you're into until, like, you're in your 20s. 
But that's what America does to defeat ideologies. They kill the people representing these ideas, and that has never worked. Right? In, in 2001, America assassinated American-born convert-turned-leader of Al-Qaeda, Anwar al-Avlaki, in a drone attack. And this just turned him into a martyr for their cause and emboldened the group even more. It's what's happened with bin Laden, ISIS's Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and the same thing is now happening with General Qassam Soleimani in Iran. He's basically become a martyr for Iranian soldiers. Now, by the way, I'm not saying that General Soleimani is a terrorist, right? I, I'm, I'm just kind of bringing up the idea that he represents something to the people of Iran, and now because he has been martyred, it's become something more. We're battling an ideology. They don't die with the person. Ideologies don't die. They shift and they change. When they're connected to a person and that person dies, it creates a vacuum of power for someone else to come in and play with it and take over it and, and morph it in, with their own other ideologies. If ideology died with their human mascots, then we wouldn't be seeing Nazis in the 2000s, right? It would mean that the, the, the civil rights movement and the Black Panthers would have died when their leaders were assassinated, but yet... Those movements continue to go on. The civil and equal rights movement gets stronger the more knowledge we gain about them, whereas the extremist ideologies get weaker. America also uses economic sanctions against countries that it's throwing a geopolitical temper tantrum at. You know, according to Pompeo and Mnuchin, the sanctions on Iran are working. They say it'll prevent Iran from doing bad things. I, I think we have a 100% confidence and we are consistent in our view that the economic sanctions are working. That if we didn't have these sanctions in place, literally Iran would have tens of billions of dollars. They would be using that for terrorist activities throughout the region and to enable them to do more bad things. And there's no question, by cutting off the economics to the regime, uh, we, we are having an impact. But like, like what? Prevent American imperialism from manifest destin destinying their resources? I mean, economic sanctions only affect the average working class people of that country. So average Iranians that have nothing to do with the war machine will be the victims. And this allows extremist ideologies to take root. Another way America handles counterterrorism is by restricting immigration with xenophobia. In 2017, in an effort to protect America from an enemy that doesn't exist, the Trump administration put into effect a ban and restriction of seven Muslim countries, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Sudan, Libya, Yemen, and Somalia. These are all countries that America has active imperialist wars going on, or ones where America is desperately trying to destabilize. These are also countries that America has claimed that there are jihadist terror, which caused 9-11. But as we saw in the 28 pages, what they revealed was it was America's ally, Saudi Arabia, that was primarily responsible for 9-11. So how do we battle extremist ideologies? Well, according to New America, we should tell the stories of the ISIS defectors, Offer them redemption and show these folks that there is a way out without more isolation and loneliness. If we also take into consideration the multiple factors of radicalization other than just Islam or terror and consider factors from disillusionment and mental health, we can offer these people some help and understanding. Along with that, we can educate people about the real history behind these groups and the causes that led them to gaining power. But that is going to involve the expansion of social programs. 
Right now, our overinflated military and counterintelligence budget is preventing the funding of necessary social programs to push progressive policies and ideas forward. We spent $3 trillion in Afghanistan alone. One third of that can fund health care, public education, infrastructure projects, along with a variety of services and programs to help people that actually need it. Right now, under the American war economy, we're putting economic sanctions on the American people for the sake of war profiteering. It's an ultimatum between the American people and the military. I think I know who I'm going to choose. It's, it's the people, just in case anybody was confused about this whole thing. Like, it would have been really weird if at the end of this whole thing I would have been like, we need to keep funding them. Like, it w what a betrayal of everything, you know? I don't, I don't wear this peace button and the movement for a people party button, uh, you know, just, just for funsies. I believe in this shit. I believe in this shit. We can stop being the only westernized country in the world without socialized health care. We can stop financially punishing people for wanting to be educated. We can stop cutting social programs that help people in need. We can stop creating a cycle of disillusionment and loneliness and work on building a system of understanding and compassion that probably won't come back to bite us in the ass. That's been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up and please share this around. Share this with a friend, with an enemy, with anybody that you think would enjoy content like this. We have a bunch of more um, anti-war, uh, 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 pro-movement uh, videos coming out in the next couple weeks that I'm very excited about. Uh, more, more stuff about anti-war movements, more stuff about the Black Panthers, um, socialist movements, and geopolitics politics. Uh, I've got some stuff in the works. Very excited about it. Uh, so uh, to, to help grow this channel, to help uh, to get this video seen by as many people as we possibly can, uh, please share this around. Um, I have live stand-up comedy. Uh, if you enjoyed the content of this video, uh, you'll probably enjoy my live stand-up comedy. I talk about similar issues, anti-establishment, anti-war issues that you're not going to hear uh, on the mainstream. So if you enjoyed this, you might enjoy my live stand-up comedy. So uh, I'm going to be on tour all across the country this year. So if you're in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Boston, Massachusetts, Portland, Maine, I'm going to be doing a show with the Vermont Law School in South Haven, Vermont. I'll be in Middlebury, Vermont, Burlington, Vermont, Bridgewater, Vermont, uh, Rochester, New York, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Huntsville, Alabama, Springfield, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, Springdale, Arkansas. I'm going to be all over the damn place, you guys. Come check out my show. Go to my uh, website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R A M A N noodlescomedy.com you can check out all of the tour dates there you can go and purchase tickets to come check out my shows there uh and uh that's that's sort of becoming the one-stop shop for all things krish mohan uh while you're on my website you can also check out past episodes of this show get caught up on a bunch of stuff um and uh you can also download my uh stand-up comedy albums including the newest album that i released last year called empathy on sale that addresses a lot of the political divides that we're seeing since the 2016 elections. Um, so go check that out, ramennoodlescomedy.com, R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Uh, and if you would like to financially help this show, there are a couple different ways that you can do that. Uh, at the top of the show, I mentioned my Patreon, patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Um, by doing that, you basically support this show, my interview podcast, Taboo Table Talk, my uh, current events little segment called The Dispatch, and uh, Road Reflections, which is more looser, ranty kind of news stories that don't fit any of the other shows that I do while I'm on tour a whole lot, as well as my DIY stand-up comedy touring. I have no corporate or small business sponsors, so I would be sponsored by you, the people. 
I am people sponsored. Uh, so go to patreon.com slash Krishmohanhaha. Uh, check out the rewards, check out the goals, see what you'd be supporting. And if you are able to uh, consider becoming a patron, it all starts at only $2 a month. But another way, if you want a different way, if you don't like the Patreon aspect of it, um, there is another way that you can become a sustaining member uh, by going to the Bandcamp page at ramennoodlescomedy.bandcamp.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.bandcamp.com. And you can become a sustaining member on the Bandcamp page. And that gives you um, monthly collections of stand-up comedy and story that aren't released to the public. These are these are the, a, a lot of material that isn't released to the public, that isn't uh, for public consumption. It would be only for the people uh, that are uh, subscribed to the sustaining membership. So uh, there's a bunch of different content, new content, uh, new material nights. You can hear early versions of my albums. You can hear alternative versions of a lot of different jokes. You can hear jokes that never made it onto an album, storytelling collections. So you get multiple different things. Uh, and that starts at $5 a month. So go to uh, my Bandcamp page, which is ramennoodlescomedy.bandcamp.com if you want an alternative. Um, I'll, be, I'll be putting uh, working on updating my website. There are some additional costs <laughs> needed to update my website, uh, and there have been some personal issues that have come up that I've got had to take care of. So I've I've unfortunately needed to kind of backlog the uh, the website for a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when, but uh, once the website is fully updated, there will be a, a very easy way to go in and take a look at the different ways to become a sustaining member or become a one-time donor uh, of my uh, of my work. Of my content that I put out. Um, and to the people that have already donated, the people that have already become patrons, thank you so much. You guys are fucking amazing. You guys are uh, awesome. And I truly, truly, truly appreciate and love each and every one of you. Every little bit, every little contribution, every little like, every little share, that all helps this show. That all helps, uh, makes this show better, gets us out to a, a wider audience. So I very much appreciate you guys. I very much appreciate all the people that uh, get to the end of these videos, <laughs> hear me ranting. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, uh, there is a, a bunch of uh, anti-war uh, pro-movement uh, videos coming out. Um, I'm, I'm going to be working on uh, some, some more stuff about anti-war movements, some stuff about the Black Panther Party, uh, uh, some stuff about what's going on in India, uh, the, the, the very misguided ways we look at socialism, uh, UBI, and um, you know what's going on with uh, automation. Uh, so those are some of the video topics that are coming up in the future that I'm very, very excited about. Some of these videos are going to be longer, so they will take me a little while to get to. Um, but I will be I will be getting to them and uh, very excited to share them uh, with you guys. I hope that you guys come out to see the live shows, um, supporting more DIY anti-establishment, anti-war comedians. Yay! We need more. <laughs> um, and if you if you don't mind, uh, I do have a ton of stuff that I've talked about with Iran in past videos that I've put out over the course of the last two weeks. I think there's like two or three of them uh, that I've done so far already. Um, so that also covers a bunch of information, a bunch of different perspectives on there as well. So you can go um, check out the backlogs of the of the videos on the channel and on the pages as well. Uh, and uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next week. See you on the road, guys. Bye.